Good evening, NABJ. Welcome to a great webinar featuring Into the Depths, the story of Tara Roberts' journey to find herself, to follow uh, Black scuba divers as they investigate the lost stories of the transatlantic slave trade. This is really an exciting project. I can't say more about how exciting it is. And I know that you will enjoy hearing from uh, Tara and our other guests who I'm going to introduce shortly. Right now, I want to let you know that in order to ask your questions later, we're gonna need you to put them in the Q&A, not the um, chat box. So Q&A later when we uh, open up for audience questions. So let me um, first introduce everybody who will be uh, in conversation as we are diving into the depths. Tara Roberts is a National Geographic storytelling explorer and a fellow at the MIT Open Documentary Lab. Prior to this work, she worked as a magazine editor and a director of communications. Kamal Siddiqui is a lifetime member of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and its immediate past president. He has logged over 1,100 open water scuba dives since 2006. He is a board member and lead instructor with Diving with a Purpose, an international organization committed to resurrecting the stories of slave shipwrecks through underwater archaeological documentation. Ar archaeological documentation. DWP is a global partner with Slave Wrecks, uh, project of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Kamau is an American Association of Underwater Scientists, Scientific Research Diver, and a PADI Certified Dive Master. Dr. Ayana Omalade Fluellen is a Black feminist, an archaeologist, a storyteller, and an artist. They is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Riverside, a scholar of anthropology and African and African diaspora studies. Fluellen advocates for greater diversity within the field of archeology span and within the broader scope of academia. She regularly presents her work at institutions, including the National Museum for Women in the Arts. They is the co-founder and current president of the Society of Black Archeologists and sits on the board of Diving with a Purpose. Now, you wanna get excited as I am about this project. So we have just a little taste, a little short video to show you right now. Black scuba divers are searching for shipwrecks from the transatlantic slave trade. It was like diving on a grave site. And honoring the 1.8 million Africans who were lost. I'm National Geographic explorer Tara Roberts, and I dropped everything to travel with these divers. Come to Costa Rica! Join me for Into the Depths, a six-part Nat Geo podcast series starting in January. It's going to be an incredible journey. Tara, it is an incredible journey. Your podcast, six episodes, four of which are up now, are so exciting. I want to start by asking you how you got involved in this. And it starts actually with history in the uh, National Museum of African American um, History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Please tell us that story. Yeah, absolutely. And hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here, to be a part of NABJ. Um, yeah, just glad to be here. So in 2017, I was living in Washington, D.C., and that was just when the National Museum of African American History and Culture had opened. Um, and it took me a minute to get tickets because I don't know if folks remember, it was hard <laughs> to get tickets for a while. But because I lived in DC, I could take my time and I could also go on off days and in the middle of the day. So I went to the museum and I happened on, I happened to go to the second floor, which is this tiny floor. Um, that just has a couple of exhibits on it. And I think it has the archival room. So a lot of people, I think, skip that floor, but I happened to go to it 
And there was a picture. It was a picture of a group of primarily black women in wetsuits on a boat. <laughs> I had never seen a group of primarily black women in wetsuits on a boat before. So the picture stopped me in my tracks um, and really captured my imagination. There was something about these women that just, they look so free and so beautiful to me. And they look like me, you know, like they spoke to me. There's a way that to me, they almost look like superheroes. Um, it was just an incredible moment. And so I looked to find out well, who are they and what are they doing? And I discovered that they were a part of this group called Diving with a Purpose. And that part of their mission was to help search for and document slave shipwrecks around the world. And that completely blew my mind and made me want to be a part of it. Now, what was the thing that pushed you to say, okay, I'm really going to do this after you, you're inspired, you, you know, think about it some more, but you know, it's a big leap literally from, from seeing a picture on a wall to diving uh, with a group of folks uh, you just read about or saw uh, in the museum. So, so what got you going in the, fi the, the thing that pushed you over? Well, I reached out to the group and I didn't say this, but in the picture, there's, there's one gentleman in the picture. Um, and it turns out it's uh, Ken Stewart, who is the co-founder of Diving With A Purpose. And so I reached out to them and I started a conversation with Ken who invited me to come diving. Um, and, and one of the ways that he drew me in was he said to me, and Ken always says my full name, when he talks to me, um, he says, Tara Roberts. He's like, Tara Roberts, do you know that you live in the epicenter of black scuba diving? And I was like, what? He was like, you live in DC and that's where the legends live. He was like the legendary black scuba divers are there. And so is um, the oldest black diving club in the United States, the underwater adventure seekers. So Ken got me a spot in the class um, which had just started. I spent three months training. And at the time I wasn't thinking about telling stories. I just wanted to be a part of this work in some way. But during that course, um, I got to know these legendary black scuba divers. And one of them is on the screen today. Uh, Kamal Siddiqui was one of <laughs> my instructors. Um, but as I got to know these divers who, I mean, they were regular people. I mean, they're more than regular people. They're, they're teachers, they're engineers, they're pilots, yoga teachers, policemen, um, just incredible people who wanted to scuba dive. And they were donating their time to train up the next generation spending their Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think, or Tuesdays and Fridays um, teaching us. And so as I got to know them and got to see how incredible they were, I felt like somebody needs to know them. They need to hear these stories. They need to know this work. And then I remembered, hello, I'm a journalist. So <laughs> maybe I should be the one that helps tell the stories. So that's what <laughs> what sort of sparked me going forward. Makes a whole lot of sense. I'm gonna go over to one of these legendary divers now. Kamal, um, I'd like to know how diving with a purpose became diving with a purpose. Because I imagine you're scuba diving, you meet some other scuba divers and does it automatically come to you that you should do more than just sort of go check out some fish? <laughs> Thank you, Kelly, for that question. I really appreciate it. But I don't know about the legendary part. I'm still working on creating my my legend there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I I'm feel real honored to be here with this illustrious, illustrious panel of, of women. I just noticed I am the only male here. So that's incredible. I feel honored. Um, but DWP, in terms of the question, um, as, as Tara mentioned, got to start back in around 2003, 2004 by Ken Stewart. And another individual named Brenda Lazendorf, um, who was an archaeologist down at one of the National Park Service parks. Uh, serpentipitously, Brenda and Ken crossed paths 
Brenda said, I need some divers to help me document these ships in this park. And Ken said, I can get you some divers. So Ken left that conversation and went back and put out the call, said, you tired of looking at these beautiful fish and these wonderful reefs? You want to dive with a purpose? Yeah, and, and several of the divers in the National Association of Black Scuba Divers responded. And as they say, the little cliche, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And we've been going forward ever since then, training uh, certified divers how to go into a wreck site, wreck site environment and really document that space for uh, a, a maritime archaeologist to study, interpret, and analyze. And so if you've got 30 dives under your belt, you got good peak buoyancy skills, you can come join us. We train uh, every summer down in, in the Keys. Uh, we've trained over 500 individuals to do this work. And we, we found this niche that, that's uh, um, in terms of documenting slave ships because we found in the record that very few of these ships has been documented. And so we, we focus on those ships um, primarily to tell their story. So Kamal, um, you know, this is more than uh, just going to do some calculations for all of you. Um, I'd like you to talk about what it means to you to be doing this work and what it means to all of you who are, as we say, diving with a purpose. Uh, it has tremendous meaning, uh, Kali, for me, purpose, uh, for particularly. Um, there's, so, there's, a, there's a deep connectivity for me. Although we have to do the science, we have to do the documentation, but there's a deep uh, genetic, if you will, connectivity here for me because we're trying to tell the story of millions of individuals, many, millions of black bodies that, that, got, uh, that was victimized in the trade, uh, that the voices have never been heard. So we got to carry those voices forward. And that's what we're trying to do. And so for me, when I dive these sites, it's, it's a very emotional, very professional, very uh, uh, sort of experience. And so, uh, when I dive it, I feel all those emotions. Mm -hmm. All those emotions come come forward, and uh, it it touches you. It really touches you, and so you have to stay focused on doing the work because that's the critical piece. If you don't do the work, we can't tell the story, right? But you know in your mind, with that deep connectivity, what has happened in this space, and so you want to get it right. But yet, you when you reach out and and touch this material, some of these artifacts. Uh, you can hear some of the voices speaking to you. And and sometimes when we dive, you know, like we've done some work in Mozambique, uh, we do these little sacred rituals before we dive. Uh, and we tell each individual, sometimes we give them a cowrie shell to put in their BCD, the little vest we wear, and say, when you dive, don't just look, but also listen, because those voices are still there. Mm -hmm. They are. And it can help us, help us uh, interrogate and investigate that site. Thank you. Dr. Flewellen, you're part of the team of uh, getting all of the facts that need to be gotten to put the story together. Um, and I, couldn't, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but once again, there's a shortage or there are very few of you Black archaeologists out here, um, period. And then doing this work um, takes on a whole other meaning. Tell me why it, uh, how you got involved. Uh, we know that Tara saw all of you, uh, saw the picture in the, in the uh, Smithsonian, you know, Kamau was drawn by the work. What, what drew you to this project, doing this kind of work? Yeah, thank you so much. And just to echo, I'm so grateful to share space with both Tara and Kamau tonight. So my introduction to DWP was through the gargaceous <laughs> and very charismatic Jay Hegler, who is a board member of Diving with a Purpose, and him along with Kamalars, who are the key collaborators with the Slave Rex Project, who have been doing quite a bit of work in various theaters with the organization. And Jay reached out to the Society of Black Archaeologists that I'm a co-founder with, along with my co-conspirator, Justin Donovan, who's a... PhD working at UCLA. And Jay was really interested in getting more um, people of African descent who were trained to do terrestrial archaeology, to do maritime work. And we've talked about, you know, how few numbers there are, less than 1% of all practicing archaeologists in America are Black. 
Um, that number is even less for those who are doing work underwater. Um, so Jay was really interested in providing those pathways that ordinarily cannot be found within the sort of institutional academic structures that most of us move through, be it through graduate school, undergraduate, um, programming. So when Jay asked if it was something I'd be interested in doing, like so many people who think about archaeology more broadly as a career being an African American, I was like, what? Doing this work underwater? I couldn't. Yeah, because I would have thought it was on land. I didn't know y'all were doing it underwater. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when Jay said he'd love to, he'd love to actually provide me with that training. I mean, I, I literally, Jay is a kind of you know non no nonsense guy. He he will tell you there are only two people in this world, people who are going to be scuba divers and people who are already scuba divers. So my hesitation was totally put aside. And the first time I did an open water dive with Jay in Saint Croix, my mind um, was blown away. Taking, I had realized that there is so much history in the ocean surrounding us, but also that it was so unexplored, so untapped into. And as someone who constantly, you know, with my work on land knows that there's so much history beneath the ground that we walk on. It's something entirely to then be introduced to the histories that are literally at the depths surrounding us as well. So I have, you know, I started diving in 2016. I'm not a member with DWP and I haven't looked back. Mm. Um, Tara, this story is deep in many ways, not just under the water, but um, in not just in your telling of the story, which also is a telling of your own journey, but in how the mechanics of, of doing this is quite detailed. As Kamau has said, you have to do the work. And what I learned early on uh, in one of the episodes is there's a lot of math involved. Like you, you don't go around and just take a picture and say, well, here we found it. There's really quite some quite a bit of detail involved in uh, getting to a wreckage and then beginning to put those pieces together that uh, Dr. Fluellen needs and uh, Kamal can also try to identify. Tell me what what you do when you're underwater with, with that math. <laughs> Tara. I have to say I was distressed to find out how much math <laughs> was in, involved. <laughs> um, but I'm actually realizing I should punt that question probably back to Ayana because the work actually starts in the archives. It doesn't start underwater. Okay. So yeah, as I, I think Ayana, you <laughs> can shed a lot of light on that. Take it away. Thanks so much, Tara, for, um, for flipping that question towards me. And I want to say that the kind of collaboration between myself and um, folks in Diving with a Purpose, it is one and the same. Kamal is fantastic at doing this archival research as well. So there's a real way that we're trying to really break open the mold of who's, you know, formally trained in this space and the sort of ivory towers and those who are doing the work on the ground and really coming together in that regard. So I just want to uplift that as well. But as Tara mentioned, this work starts in the archive. Oftentimes it starts by we make a living in the water surrounding us, right? So if you can imagine people who work in fisheries, the folks who are doing work in the scuba industry, those are the people who know these waters intimately and are oftentimes the folks who have the histories and the knowledge around what wreck site, what metal anomalies are available. And then being able to go back to the archives and actually look at, you know, the data that's provided to us. So someone asked how many ships have Five. It's less than 10, I believe. And if you think about the over what, um, 12,000 ships involved, the, tw the 1,000 ships that sunk, there are so many that have yet to be recovered. And the one thing that we know, especially if you do work on the transatlantic slave trade, these European entities were meticulous about the sort of documentation of their goods, right? And during this time period, enslaved Africans were good the way that they meticulously kept track of those records allows us to have these in-depth conversations today to really know the ships, 
the numbers, for instance, sometimes if you're lucky, you might even get names. So that kind of that kind of work really starts in the archive. And then being able to actually go into the water, I want to now punt the question to the Kamal, who's done so much of that work around just laying the baseline, the triline. And so I'd love for him to talk about his expertise as a lead um, instructor with Diving with a Purpose and the work that goes into that. I want to come out to hold that just one second because I want to give people a, a little listen of Tara having gotten the lessons from both you, Dr. Fluellen, and you, uh, uh, Kamau, uh, from the podcast. So let's take a listen to an excerpt from one of the episodes of the podcast with Tara under the water. I descended. The water was this murky blue and green. It felt warm against my skin. Schools of fish were swimming by. I exhaled and descended further. I felt so at home under the water. Then I saw it, the outline of an anchor. It was partially submerged on the sandy ocean floor. The fish are, are cool, but that site is just amazing because you have an archaeological site exactly where you've got tourists snorkeling and in, enjoying the wildlife, but you have this amazing story that's just lying there as an open-air museum for everybody to see. Uh, so it's, it's chilling that way. You've got this crazy story about capturing slaves and then they're getting freed, but you've got this right on the beach and right in this beautiful place. That is uh, from one of the episodes of Into the Depths, the six-part podcast by Tara Roberts, which features um, two of our other guests tonight, um, both Dr. Fluellen and um, Kamau Siddiqui. And I want you to note that the uh, what you're looking at is the cover of National Geographic with Tara's uh, picture on it. And she is the first African-American to be on the cover of uh, African-American uh, National Geographic Explorer to be on the cover of uh, National Geographic. So this is uh, history all around us. Um, Kamau, I wanna go back to you now and have you pick up um, from Dr. Fluellen and continue the process of how this comes together. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you, Ayano, for, for kicking it over to me. Yeah, as mentioned, I'm a lead instructor with Diving with a Purpose, and, and what we do with these certified divers is that we don't just throw them on a boat and then push them off the boat into the water, no. <laughs> uh, what we do initially, we have some classroom sessions on the first day, and then we sort of set up a, a mock wreck on land and sort of get them orientated toward the activities they're going to be doing. And one of the uh, activities is uh, something we call trilateral racing. We set down a transect that is a line in the wreck area to give references to all the material culture that was in this wreck site, the artifacts, if you will. And so from that reference, we have to locate where those artifacts are. And that's the trilateration part. We actually do measurements and write down numbers. Uh, it's not heavy math. I mean, it's stuff that you can, you've learned by the time you got past your fifth grade general math, Tara, right? <laughs> so these measurements and, but more importantly, you gotta be meticulous because what we're doing is the image of the picture that you see on the bottom of the ocean as we're trying to lift that off the bottom of the ocean and create a map of that to be interpreted later by the, by the archeological professionals. So you have to be meticulous and precise with the measurements and, and writing down numbers and things like that. And so once we do that trilateration, you gotta start beginning to focus on an artifact, something of interest that is particularly of interest to the archeologists. And you have to draw a nice picture of that. I mean, if you can draw a stick man, you can draw a picture of these artifacts, right? <laughs> it's, it's not very challenging, but it does take some, some learning. And once we draw those pictures, we bring it all together in this composite map that I mentioned. And you can see what we see uh, in this map uh, on the bottom of the ocean. That's, I mean, it is really quite something what, what you're doing and telling this story. 
um, all of you and, and Tara, this is your journey. I, I just wanna respond to something in the chat, which is that you have not missed the cover uh, uh, with Tara on it. It comes up in March. So you, have, so you can get a chance to get a copy of National Geographic to get that copy uh, with Tara on the cover and with her story uh, inside as well. But back to you, Tara, and I just, this is a question for all of you, actually. I'm just taken with listening to the podcast and hearing your voices and hearing you now with how much it feels like it's a spiritual journey that's just imbued in all of the work that you're doing and in the working together. Tara, I know you've spoken about that. Um, please um, express um, what, that, what that connectivity feels like while you are working together doing this that spiritual connectivity. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll say two, two things, one, one really quick thing. Um, one of our advisors on the podcast, um, some of you may know her, Linda Villarosa, who's an amazing journalist and she's a mentor of mine. Um, and she listened to some early episodes and we were checking to see, does this feel like it's something that comes from National Geographic? And she's like, yeah, it does. And it feels like some black people made this. <laughs> and I think it's because of that level, um, that extra layer of spiritual connection um, to the story. Ayana mentioned, no, actually Kamal mentioned a bit earlier how many people perished um, in the Middle Passage. So you have the estimated, estimated number is about 1.8 million people. It's not five people, not a thousand people, not 1.8 million people perished that we know of, that, that we estimate. We don't even know how many perished on the march to the ships, but in the water, 1.8 million people perished. Who's grieving those people? Who's mourning them? Where's the memorial to those folks? Um, so part of this work is in acknowledgement of those lives and it's in honor of those lives. And so it feels like really sacred work. Um, and it also feels like work that is I think the word that I would use here, it's, it's work that is full of agency, that is full of power. There's something about us as regular folks, I, I use that word in quotes, regular folks who raised their hands and said, we wanna be a part of helping to bring this lost history up from the depths and back into memory. Like we're not gonna wait on somebody who doesn't look like us to put it in a book and tell us that that's what our history is. We're saying that, no, we have power, we have agency to be able to go out and find that history and say it's important. So um, I think that that adds definitely another spiritual layer. And I think that the ancestors are speaking to all of us and that their time of reckoning is here and they're asking to be seen. They're asking for their souls to be put at rest. So one of the things that we wanted to do throughout the podcast was to give honor and acknowledgement to them by speaking their names. And of course we won't know the names of all the people who passed. We won't know the names of most of the people who passed, but still throughout the episodes, we try to speak the names that we can so that those folks are not just faceless statistics. They are actual people. They are mothers, fathers, farmers, scientists, daughters, husbands, wives. And we're saying that we see you and we wanna uplift your story. Dr. Llewellyn, these are graves, really, grave sites, really, for, for us. These are our ancestors down there. So do you feel the same way about the, it feels very spiritual, this work? Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with Tara. And I think it's something I'm looking at the chat as well, where people are just really taking in the magnitude by having the numbers. So 
when I think about the numbers, the 12.5 million Africans that made were forced to make that crossing, the 1.8 million souls that were lost in the ocean, the 36 voyages that were made, just really wanting to have people grapple with the gravity of this, right? So like that's one aspect of it. And another aspect that I like to really focus on the space of grief and mourning is really also thinking about what it means for black divers to be alive and breathing underwater doing this work. There's something about that particular work of like the actual breath. And I think about Kamal who has these fantastic images of him literally like floating in the water column, really focused on his breath, lifting him up and down that in the Atlantic ocean with so much history tied to black death, grief and black mourning it actually means something for black bodies to be breathing alive doing this work choosing to do this work and even when you think about the kind of recreational work that black people are doing in water all of that really works to transform this narrative as well so it's certainly a spiritual space and it certainly is a spiritual space that can't be um, taken for granted that can't be separated out from the archaeological work doing this very scientific work that we're doing, all of it is intertwined. Kamal? Yes, Carla, you know, you know, when we dive, when I dive particularly, we're, we're diving for the ancestors. You know, if you, if you just read a little bit of, of uh, say, Marcus Redeker's uh, A Slave Ship, A Human History, some of the incredible stories, and you know, even some of the slave narratives, um, if you have a heart, <laughs> you will be touched and touched profoundly. So, so this work is, is very, very critical. Someone mentioned something about forensics in the chat there. Yeah, this is, this is CSI work, crime scene investigation. The, the whole phenomena of the trade was a crime against humanity. Never in the history of humanity has so many people been forcefully uh, moved against their will. So we have to document this story. Uh, Ayan alluded to the number of vessels that uh, we know about. There was some 36,000 plus voyages involving probably in the number, as, as uh, Tara mentioned, we can't quite zoom in on the exact number, but we know there was at least 15 plus thousand ships involved in this trade. And over a thousand had wrecking events, but we only have awareness that is location of about, say, 15. Mm. And of those 15, well, probably about six or seven has been scientifically, quote, documented. So there's a tremendous volume of work out there that needs to be done. And so what well, has to be done, uh, of course, technically or scientifically, but also given the, the number of human beings that's been affected from, from this experience, there has to be some sort of uh, a sacredness about it. And again, it's a very emotional work, a very moving work, but work that has to be done. So we're all people of the griot. So we're gonna pass these stories down and we're gonna keep passing them down. And the more you bring up um, from the bottom to tell us about, you know, we'll know. But we're also journalists in this group. And we are in an environment now where there is a concerted and in some places a legal effort to stop the telling of these stories, the sharing of these stories. And I wonder how each of you respond to that and how uh, we work around that because, it's, you know, you, that's the only thing you can do. There are actual laws on the books, as many of us know, that say you can't talk about something that might cause somebody anguish or make them uncomfortable. And this is just uncomfortable history. So I'll start with you, Tara. I think this is also healing history. There's something that is really powerful, I think, about engaging with the actual material evidence. So th this can't be denied. This is actual evidence of what happened um, centuries ago. So there's something about engaging with that actual evidence that allows you to move through it. Um, and what I've found is that there's something about this story, there's something about divers that are engaged in finding this history that gives people a different entree point. 
or entry point. So I think a lot of the ways that we approach the past, um, especially black folks past, is that we center inside of our pain and our trauma. And there's something about this work that is surprisingly about our healing. It's about the opportunity to transform and to move through some of those spaces of pain and trauma. So I know that didn't completely answer your question, um, but I think that there's something that's almost magical that's happening here that might move us around some of these barriers in surprising ways. Um, I'm not sure if that's translating, but mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting from the reception of this story so far. It feels like, like people are hungry for it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also our responsibility to take on, just as you said, passing these stories and educating ourselves despite what sort of barriers we might come across. Lamar, what would you add to that? Yes, sure. I, I would just add very quickly, Kelly, um, in terms of this notion of discomfort, particularly when someone is speaking truths, you know, you, you're being discomforted by truth. Uh, so what are we going to do? We're going to start shutting down museums, right? Um, just because it, it creates this level of discomfort, that shouldn't be the barometer for, for going forward and, and speaking these truths. And we'll continue to do that. We know that uh, uh, the current environment is, is reactionary, maybe out of some sort of fear that this truth is going to be revelatory, you know, and reveal some things that, uh, uh, that, that might, you know, going to probably you don't want others to know or hear, hear about. But it has to be told. Those truths have to be spoken. That's been too much suffering. So after the, the reconciliation and the healing that's really involved in this, that has to be a profound sense of justice. And that justice has to come forward in these truths. And so that's what we're doing. We're bringing these truths that's been suppressed, distorted, distractions created, etc., to uh, keep these voices silent. But they're speaking now in a very powerful way. You know, I don't want to sound corny here, but, you know, Dr. King quoted some philosopher about truth being crushed to earth. Not only is it rising again, it's rising from the depths of these oceans where we lost so many of our ancestors. William Cullen Bryant, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Dr. Flewellen, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, just wanting to add on to both Kamal and Tara sharing, archeology span is keenly positioned right now to really combat this, um, our American society that is based on a collective amnesia and denial of its history, right? There is something very, important as Tara had mentioned and as I said in other spaces that archeology span being able to actually touch the materials, being able to actually see what people were eating off of. On the site that I work in St. Croix, you can walk into the homes of where enslaved Afro-Caribbean people lived as they labored on these sugar plantations. You can't deny that history, you can't re-envision what that is, right? So there's a there's a, a keen a keen way that archaeology really is playing against that that narrative, right? That narrative that's trying to erase this history by positioning it as this like force that while we look at things in the past, it is directly impacting the present right now and how we conceive of ourselves in the future. So I would encourage, you know, um, instructors in K through 12 classrooms, as well as college educators to turn to the materiality of this history, because I can tell you so much engagement when I show my students, you know, actual drums that were a part that were on these ships that made these crossings, seed beads that have been found in these spaces. There's something about being able to see the actual plates, for instance, that enslaved Africans ate off of the jewelry, the clothing fasteners that they wore. Like that kind of that kind of history that puts that flesh, right? That puts that humanity on that we're talking about. It 
it opens up so many more spaces of inquiry. So, yeah. Well, thought. it's a perfect uh, lead in to uh, uh, our Q and A from the audience um, because it's perfect spaces for inquiry from our group here tonight. I uh, thank you all for this uh, just great conversation. I can't say enough about that podcast. It's really something, Tara. <laughs> all right, let's take some questions. Uh, how many rex sinkings are well enough documented or known to embark on a search? So I guess what he's asking about the archival work first, that I guess would determine where you might go. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, Carla, we, we, we know about 15 locations that of wrecks that uh, these vessels participated in the trade. Um, and the ones that has been documented, you know, that, that, that work has been done, but these others uh, needs to be documented as well. And then we, in, in the archives, there are records of other wrecking events as well. So that work, that work needs to be done. So we have a number on a number of wrecks, if you will, on our list that we would like to engage. Um, there's been a lot of press about the last slave ship that came into the U.S., the Clotilda, which I had the good fortune of doing some work on, uh, which is an incredible artifact, by the way, because that is the only material evidence that we can actually look at that our ancestors were actually in this hole of this ship. That's no, in the archaeological record, that's nothing else there. So that's very important. Even the, the pen, penultimate one that came into the U.S., the Wanderer, we know where we know where the crash site is, the wrecking site is, but no work has been done on it at all. And it came into the U.S. right around the time, right before the one, the uh, Clotilda. So it plays an critical a critical part as well in the history of of the U.S. So um, that work needs to be done, and that's, that's several of of them as well. Okay. Um, here, I had a chance to visit Biscayne National Park near one of your dive sites. How did you discover the slave ship wreckage? What was the first clue? Well, I think they might be referring to the Guerrero wreck. Uh, the Guerrero was an incredible story of, of piracy during the trade. Um, and there's a lot of people that have done some very good work on that. I'll uh, refer folks to the work of Gail Swanson on the Guerrero. She wrote it, the initial work and did the initial independent research that gave us a lot of clues. But there's a lot of tangible sort of evidence. The Guerrero crashed on a reef that uh, has a lot of dynamic ocean forces and the wreck is very scattered. Um, other archeologists have investigated the site as well. So you find things like pieces of the ship, like uh, cannonballs and even cannons themselves or coronade, little small cannons. You even find she thing that they put on the side of the ship uh, to prevent sort of protect it from sea worms from eating up the wood we found some of that material as well but like <clears throat> excuse me like the henrietta marie which is another vessel that's been very well documented in the trade uh, they found the actual veil bell and it said henrietta marie right on the bell and you know you got it then but mm -hmm. those types of smoking gun sort of evidence is very difficult to find in these wrecks we're talking about 6, 16, 17, 18th century wrecks and uh, in very dynamic environments, things are constantly changing, being blown around by storms and wave actions and so forth. But there is material evidence there that we can investigate to, to help tell these stories. Um, I lost a question, but I believe the person asked, do you have to be black? I assume that's referring to, <laughs> to be a part of diving with a purpose. And he wanted to, all, or the person, I don't know if it's he or she, wanted to know how how far down are you? What is the depth of most of these wrecks? Well, the only criteria is you have to be a very good diver, you okay. know, and you're willing to tell the story. Uh, most of these, these wrecking events took place on reefs. So those reefs are very shallow. There are some, there's some that are deeper, uh, that sunk uh, 100 plus feet, but the majority of them on average is around 20 to 30 feet. So it's not very challenging dives uh, in terms of diving, but it just, uh, it is challenging to do the work because we want people to have good, as I said earlier, good buoyancy skills, because mm -hmm. we don't want to disturb that record that's laying on the floor. As, as Yana can tell you, if you disturb that material on the floor, it, it's, uh, 
it affects the story and what the evidence and information we can gather from that site. Um, is diving with a purpose also working on the salvaging of Tuskegee Airmen plane wreckage in Lake Michigan? Uh, you said a, a bad word there, salvaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm reading the questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> no, no words. <laughs> salvaging, um, I understand the question. Yeah, we do have done some work up there and we, that work is ongoing. Wayne Lusardi, who is the, the state archaeologist there, called us in to, to document a Tuskegee Airman's airplane up there back in 2015. And we did that work, and uh, re most recently we, we uh, installed a memorial up there to memorialize the, the Tuskegee Airmen that was lost. There's about six wrecks up there in, in the uh, Lake Huron that we're aware of. We've only found a couple of them, so we, there's going to be some ongoing work to locate the other ones as well and document those wrecks. What are some hurdles for minorities, including women, specific to diving, if any? What Was it an accepting arena? I'm guessing no, since there's so few of you, Doc, Dr. Fluella. <laughs> yeah, I've done a little bit of um, research on this. So a lot of the sort of barriers of access for, arche uh, for archaeologists of color to get into this field often come from the just financial inaccessibility of this work. Um, it cost a great deal of money to do a field school, so additional programming that undergraduates or graduate students are made available to them is quite costly. Even if you think about the kinds of programming that um, DWP offers, one of the brilliant aspects of this work, especially for the youth training component, is that it is of no cost to the youth, right? So really thinking about what it means to create pathways that really break open these traditional barriers that ordinarily are in the way of getting more people of color into these spaces. Once you get past will cost to be to do terrestrial or underwater work, you know, having adequate mentorship in these spaces to really guide and retain students, faculty in this profession is really key in this aspect of um, surviving and thriving in this field as well. So once again, just wanting to really highlight the work that Diving with a Purpose has done as an outside organization to really foster these kind of programs for students to be involved in this work for myself, other um, graduate students who are also a part of Diving with a Purpose who ordinarily would not have these opportunities open to us. So I would just say that those are some of like the sort of key barriers that we see. And then of course, there are microaggressions that each of us can sort of attend to and attest to from being black in these spaces, from doing, um, from being women in these spaces as well, being gender non-conforming. So there are all kinds of ways that microaggressions up that also deter people from like staying in this field and doing this but it's diving with a purpose it's the national association of black scuba divers that has really been providing a home base and a ground base for black scuba divers to really find community in doing this work uh, tara this is to you in your podcast i really appreciated how you talked about the community's role in finding and even talking about a shipwreck or other significant site, it seems almost intuitive to do, yet that does not seem like that standard practice in academia, archeology. span Could you speak more about this and please correct me if I'm mistaken, thank you. What's, what's so great about this panel um, and being here with Kamal and Ayana um, normally I'm, I'm speaking alone about some of these things. So it's really great to have them here. And actually this is square in Ayana's world. So if you wanna talk a little bit about community archeology, span that would be fantastic, Ayana. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key things that, you know, the Society of Black Archaeologists really pushed forth is that the kind of heritage work that we want to see moving forward is at the helm of communities that are ingrained and impacted by this research. So oftentimes when you think about underwater archaeology or archaeology that's done on land, the idea that comes to mind is like Indiana Jones, have these images of white people that are extracting history and destroying sacred sites. What we want are archaeologists that literally are at and in, in like the supervisors, our bosses, 
are the community members that are attached to this project, right? So what does it mean for us to be in service to them versus being in service to our institutions or the granting agencies that provide us with funding? That completely shifts the kind of questions that are asked Right? because it centers on what the community needs from that particular site, be it like their desires to know that history or their desires to create, you know, um, viable, sustainable economic sort of tourism from these spaces or how they even want to disseminate. So share that knowledge outward. Oftentimes for archaeologists that are in academic settings or that do cultural resource management, we type our reports, they're published in journals and people in the community don't see them, right? But that we're doing in St. Croix, people want to see art installations around it. They want to see plays created for it. What would it look like to have a children's book written about this history? You know, so there are just all these ways that when the community is actually at the front and center of this work, it transforms how heritage is done in this country for the better. All right. How old is your oldest diver who is working with you all? Oh, Kamal, talk about Dr. Jones. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Albert Jose Jones, an incredible, a, a true legend, an incredible individual. Uh, Tara was talking about the training early. He's trained literally probably 5,000 plus uh, folks to dive. And I'm so honored to have on my, my dive certification, uh, his name. Dr. Jones is, he's the uh, only African-American that's been inducted in the International Divers Hall of Fame. Uh, he started back. He started diving back in the '50s, and uh, I, I think he, he he officially maybe has hung up his fins, but he did get a maybe a dive or two in last year. So Dr. Jones is well into his 80s. Uh, again, an incredible, incredible individual. He's a, he was a retired uh, <coughs> marine biologist. I uh, taught here in, in Washington D.C. area, and he's trained all those individuals I mentioned earlier. Uh, Tara, how much did you pay for your training? Not, not one red cent, zero. And is, he's a very gracious individual, uh, an incredible man. Uh, he's gonna be getting some awards here recently. He was just recognized. And so to sort of put the Dr. Jones in the context, I always say, Dr. Albert Jose Jones, well, Jacques Cousteau is the black Dr. Jones. All so right. So sort of put him in the context. <laughs> an incredible individual. I can't say enough, we don't have, we need to spend a whole two hour panel session on just Dr. Jones and his work, seriously. Wonderful. Is there any idea of where those shipwrecks might be found and or easier to find? The Caribbean, closer to Africa, or some, somewhere else? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, all of the above. Uh, this was a transoceanic trade. We got we have wrecks in, in the uh, South Indian Ocean around Reunion Island and, and Mauritius. Uh, there's wrecks all along the western coast of the continent. There's wrecks around, around St. Helena Island, right in the remotest part of the, of the uh, South Atlantic, where the French and the British used to take these ships and, and try to, uh, when they was intervening in the so-called Africa fleet, trying to discourage the trade, took them down to St. Helena Island, and, and, and some of them uh, uh, was, was sunk around that particular island. There's, there's wrecks along, all along the Caribbean, around most of those islands, and even up and, up and down the, the eastern seaboard. A wreck was discovered as far north as Massachusetts, the, Massachusetts, the Weta, although it wasn't involved in the trade. Uh, it, was, it was a pirate ship by then, but we know it had some history of being involved in the trade. So these, these wrecks are global, and uh, you know, it, it's going to take a tremendous effort to do the critical work. But, you know, I'm probably going to be hanging up my fins in 20, 30 years. But as Ayana mentioned, we're trying to prime the pipeline with young folks with our YDWP, Youth Diving with a Purpose program, to carry this work forward. Mm -hmm. How many divers now and going forward are needed to investigate all of the known sites? There's no fixed number. We need you all to, to step up to the line, you know, to, to do this work and get the training. The DWP provides the training. There's other organizations that provide similar training. We hope you come through the, the DWP conduit, but uh, get the skills. And as the projects come online, if you got the skills, hopefully you can get on this mission and start documenting some of these wrecks. But uh, we need as many, all hands on deck. Um, I think you've answered this question, but in case you want to add something to it, I'll ask 
uh, it again. What methods are used for choosing where in the Atlantic Ocean to look for these shipwrecks with so many more wrecks to find in such a vast area in which to search? Where do you begin? Um, Dr. Flewellen, is there something you want to add to what no, you said? Well, yeah, just to reiterate before, it really comes from the sort of synthesis of the documentary research that's done in our archives. And it also is in tandem with actual surveying of different waters as well. So there's like this huge initiative through NOAA, for instance, to actually document the waters surrounding the continental United States, because there's still so much that we haven't even documented, especially when it comes to our deep oceans as well. So it really comes from, you know, the archival documentation, going out and doing these large scale, you know, magnetometer surveys, sonar surveys that really can document anomalies that are on the ocean floor, being able to then go back and truth and ground truth those with scuba diving. So there's so many different steps that sort of lead up to actually being able to set up a baseline as Kamal mentioned before and really get to surveying and documenting a wreck site that happened on the, on the front end of it. So I'm gonna combine two questions because we're coming up on the end of this conversation. Um, have you found anything that you discovered in the wrecks that really surprised you and what type of artifacts are you finding? Um, well, if it's a slave ship, we got an idea of what sort of material culture was on these vessels. Uh, we haven't found any human remains yet. I wanna add that, although we, in one of our locations, we were prepared for that. We thought it might've been a possibility, but there hadn't been any, any big, big, uh, big surprises. We know we're gonna find shackles, you know, we know we're gonna find other metal sort of material that was on the boat, on the ship, like cooking pots and so forth. And either pieces of the ship itself, you know, they have, they're held together with nails and spikes and things like that. Uh, these cells or uh, pieces of cells, uh, that was used uh, you know, to move the vessel forward. So all that material uh, uh, sort of collects in certain sort of ways in the, in the ocean and, and uh, in the wrecking landscape, you, you're bound to find uh, some of that material. But um, in terms of a slave ship, you know, shackles for sure, you know, that's what we sort of uh, zoom in on. They're very detectable to, through metal detection. Um, so we kind of look for those telltale signs to, for sure to say this is the type of vessel. And we also look at the whatever remaining wood material might be there because it's a good indicator of how the ship was built, where it was built, the type of wood that was used to, to build the ship. And all that you know can be correlated with the archival records and say, yes, this is what we're looking for. Dr. Flewellen, was there anything that you found that surprised you? I mean, for me, going off of Kamal's sharing around all the material culture that you can find, the actual remains of the ship, it's discussed, like thinking about it as a forensic site. When you actually are able to piece together those different fragments to actually have these diagnostic features around that could help you actually date a particular vessel, there's something about just knowing the dimensions of the hull itself where you can actually think about what it meant to be in those spaces and the kind of embodied experience of moving or lack thereof in those spaces that really can speak to the kind of experiences that we're trying to illuminate. So just wanting to highlight that although the material that we find is few and far in between, the actual stories that can be interpreted from it are so, so deep and vast. We have 30 seconds for you, Tara, to say something before we close this out. And before I let you say that, Dr. Fluell and some people in the chat want to interview you. So please be prepared for getting those requests. Tara. <laughs> uh, do you want me to? Whatever, if you have a, a closing thought, you may have it. And now 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, great. So. I'm so encouraged to see all of these questions in the chat window. Um, there's so much information here, so much history, so many stories. You can see why I was taken by these divers and felt so um, how necessary it was to share the story um, in, in bigger and wider ways. So I hope that you listen to the podcast 
we interview, I think there are about 40 voices of historians, archeologists, scuba divers, descendants, a whole host of people who talk about a lot of um, parts of this journey. Okay, I wanna thank all of you. That's a six part podcast, Into the Depths. You can get more information, natgeo.com slash Into the Depths. Talk about it, listen to it, share it. It's fantastic. I didn't have to be unbiased, so I can say that. And I thank you so much to all of the panelists tonight and for all of you who joined us uh, for the webinar. Thanks, NABJ. Thank you, Carla. It's a pleasure. Thank you.